Hiya, hope you're all doing really well. I thought I'd quickly film a little intro to my Scaredy Cat Readathon reading vlog. The wonderful, endlessly delightful Smriti over at Sun Reads has devised the Scaredy Cat Readathon over the month of October to encourage us to read books that intimidate us, that genuinely scared us in terms of the content that's in them, and books that we're scared to miss out on, that people are telling us we need to read, and that sort of built up this idea of this book in our head, and that's made us scared to pick them up. It's to encourage us to work through those feelings. So that's what I'll be doing. And I thought I'd show you the TBR that I have over the next few weeks, the books I want to get to. The first book I plan on getting to is Sand Talk by Tyson Yun Kapoda. I'm just going to read the blurb. We are accustomed to a certain way of thinking. We want the world to be simple, but we talk about it in complicated ways. Indigenous thinking is different. It knows the world is complex and finds deep ways to communicate this knowledge through pictures, carvings, and stories. Tyson Yun Kapoda uses sand talk, which honors the Aboriginal custom of drawing images on the ground to bring clarity to complexity. He asks, what happens if we bring an Indigenous perspective to the big picture, to history, education, money, power? Can we in fact have proper concepts of sustainable life without Indigenous knowledge? He challenges us to think differently and save the world. So the reason this book is on the Scaredy Cat Readathon TBR is that I'm afraid that I won't be able to appreciate the full magnitude of the wisdom and the insights that Tyson Yun Kapoda will impart to us readers. I think that's why I've been a bit anxious going into this, that I've been, that I need to be in like the best frame of mind so I can really absorb everything. Yeah, I'm excited and Keen. The next book I'm planning on getting to is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. As someone who says she enjoys reading feminist literature, the fact that I have not read this book is a travesty. This is definitely a glaring hole on the feminist literature reading list, if there is one. Um, if there is, please send it to me. So this is a semi-autobiographical novel by Sylvia Plath. It deals with mental health, it deals with patriarchy. Um, I'm especially excited to explore themes of mental health in this book. I think that's a journey that I've personally been on this year. I'm really excited to connect with this book and yeah, just finally read something that I've long awaited to read. Oh, why is this on the Scaredy Cat Readathon? Definitely a FOMO book. I have left this unread way too long, but that's gonna change. And the final book I wanna be getting to is Picnic at Hanging Rock by Joan Lindsay. This is very clearly on this TBR because I'm terrified of the story of this book. I saw a theater adaptation with my school in an excursion when, when I was near 11, I think. And oh my God, that gave me nightmares. It was so well done, but it was so creepy. This is about a group of girls who are at a private finishing school. They go on a picnic one day, but then a bunch of them disappear and only one returns and she cannot remember where everyone went. It sounds so creepy, so eerie, definitely out of my comfort zone as well. I don't generally read very scary fiction. I'm so excited to read this though. I've heard amazing things. These are the three books that I'll be getting to over the next few weeks and I'll try and keep you posted and give you some aesthetic footage along the way. So yeah, let's do this. But also, can we talk about this cover? It is beautiful. It is a cloth bound hardback amazing print. I love everything about this. This was actually a Christmas present and oh my god. Mom, you know me so well. This is beautiful.
Speaking of scary things, this is my TBR. There are over 100 books. I think we're sitting at 115 books at the moment. Little TARDIS there. Love me, my Doctor Who. I have a little designated spot for borrowed books. Look at this impromptu bookshelf tour. This is very unorganized. I'm definitely getting a lot of anxiety looking at this. It is the morning of October 5th. Yes, it is Monday morning. I thought I'd film a little reading update. I <laughs> had the lovely experience of waking up spontaneously at like 4.30 a.m. I started Picnic at Hanging Rock. I'm only on page 12, so I'm just getting the lay of the land. We're being introduced to uh, some of the characters. There are a lot of them. <laughs> Join Lindsay has very helpfully provided a list of characters at the start. Like it's a play. And then that list of characters is followed by whether picnic at hanging rock is fact or fiction my readers must decide for themselves as the fateful picnic took place in the year 1900 and all the characters who appear in this book are long since dead it hardly seems important if that isn't a spine tingly creepy sentence to get started with i don't know what it is the girls are just about to embark on the titular picnic. Things are hotting up. As for the bell jar, I've read about 90 pages of this. It's slow and heavy. It's very atmospheric. You get this sense of a very oppressive, dry, heavy atmosphere. I think that's something that both of these books have in common is they both feature a very heavy, hot, oppressive sort of atmosphere. The narrator in this book, Esther Greenwood, is such an interesting character. She's very unlikable, she's judgmental, she's catty, but she's also painfully self-aware. There's a really subtle dry wit in this um, that is almost so subtle that you could miss it. Plath is a master of the written word, that's no surprise. So we're just following Esther Greenwood who is a college student but doing like a summer a workshop, summer internship, summer job with a ladies magazine in New York. We're just going through the day-to-day -day of her job, of her friends, of dating, but we're also getting glimpses into her past, her schooling, of past relationships, especially her relationship with this one young man named Buddy Hollard. There's definitely a really strong says of malaise and melancholy. One thing that I found really surprising and very fascinating is a very cavalier sort of tone and attitude uh, surrounding sex, which is something I did not expect this book being set when it is, I think in the 1950s. So I can definitely see that Sylvia Plath was transgressing a lot of boundaries when she was writing this. So I've started two out of three books on my Scaredy Cat Readathon TBR, and I will keep you posted uh, when I read more. Oh, time for another coffee and some very buttery toast.
decided to take a walk this morning. It was really lovely and mild. I've seen so many birds and flowers and butterflies and dogs. <laughs> so it's been a really good morning. I thought I'd have a little sit down and update you on how my reading is going. So I finished about two thirds of the bell jar last night before I went to sleep. And it was just as it was getting really, really dark. Um, so definitely <laughs> content warnings for anyone who's planning on reading the bell jar for themes of suicide, of depression, of severe mental illness, of very carceral psychiatric care. Um, there are, you know, that can be very triggering, um, I know. So yeah, definitely fair warning going into it. So in light of that, I decided to take a little break. Um, and this morning I continued with Picnic at Hanging Rock. And just before I embarked on this walk, I finished the chapter that introduced the catalyst of the book, the, the main sort of mystery has transpired and now we're going to get the fallout of that all the different stories all the different points of view and getting into that real psychological aspect of that thriller i hope you can hear me um hope it's not too loud and that i'm not sitting too far away from the camera also i'm very sweaty i apologize but one thing i am noticing about picnic at hanging rock is she has such interesting descriptions of the settings. All the natural settings have been described in this really ominous and threatening way. It's very beautiful, but that beauty is in itself threatening because it's unknowable. It's an unknowable kind of beauty. It's something that, you know, we can't colonize or settle because it's just too big. And all of the man-made settings are also described in a really interesting way. It's a lot of, false appearances, a lot of false facades, a lot of pretenses that are embodied through the buildings that are a bit too pompous for the natural surrounding. It's kind of hard to describe and it's probably a bit too early. I need a few more coffees. There's a sense of everything being a bit mismatched, of being a bit out of place, which makes it really disorienting and it makes it really uncomfortable to read, which I think is a really, which I think is part of the atmosphere of the book. and and part of why it's so creepy because you can't settle in. It's all, everything just feels a bit, a bit off. So that's a little reading update. I'm going to continue on my walk and check in with you later in the day. by Sylvia Plath and I have lots of thoughts on it. It really took it out of me actually. Um, I was sort of mentally quite exhausted for the rest of the day which is why I didn't film a reading update because <laughs> I just was a bit useless after I finished this. It deals with themes of depression and rigid gender roles, expectations of women, white middle class women but you know women. It really touches on so many things and it's told in this meandering lull. It was really visceral and almost surgical in its precision. I think the way that Sylvia Plath has rendered those experiences of, of traveling through periods of depression, you know, coming out of a depressive episode myself over the past few months, this was a really visceral read. I think I still need to wait for the dust to settle in the wake of finishing this book. I've got lots of scattered little thoughts and, and, and opinions lying around, so um, I will need some time to sort of formulate that and digest that a bit. Then, I read, this is not Picnic at Hanging Rock, <laughs> let me go get it. Oh god, there goes some more covers. I am about halfway through. It's told in this really, like, dry, sardonic, very E.M. Forster-esque tone. Every now and again you get these little satirical, sarcastic asides that the the narrator is just giving you little tidbits about the character, making little remarks, you know, providing some commentary, and sometimes they can sort of take you away from the main thread of the plot.
as you can see, I finished Picnic at Hanging Rock by Joan Lindsay. I have so many thoughts on this book. I don't think I can get into everything in this vlog, otherwise we will be here four days. But I think we're in for a really interesting end of month reading wrap up. This book was very creepy, but it didn't necessarily go in the direction I expected it to go. It's the kind of creepy book I really like when it's creepy because you're not really sure what's happening and you start to question things and the really subtle sort of happenings and how they all link together, creating this really unnerving thread of events and this really eerie atmosphere, like that really subtle creepy. I think the creep, yeah, the creepiness in this novel really did come from the atmosphere, the oppressive, harsh, suffocating atmosphere. I really enjoyed this. I thought the mystery was really gripping. I really liked reading about the characters. I thought they were all really, really interesting. I really loved the way how the event of the girls disappearing on the rock influenced the rest of the community and what it led to and the sort of ripple effect it had throughout the town and the school and the teachers and the students. It was yeah, it was just a really fascinating read. I'm so sorry if you can hear my neighbour mowing their lawn. Also a side note, abolish front lawns. A waste of land and resources. And it was really fascinating to read this as a sort of hallmark text in the Australian canon. This is a renowned Australian classic. This is very much part of our cultural context. Basically how the Australian, so-called Australian, identity was depicted throughout this book was really interesting as well. The one thing I do have to say is I didn't really get a lot of the turn of the century historical references. I think those kind of went over my head a bit. Like words are used for different things. It's so weird. Like I had to look up the word crocodile because in my mind a crocodile is a huge scaly reptile that eats people but apparently the word crocodile is also used to describe like a line of people marching or a line of schoolgirls marching or something like that. So when I first read that sentence and the crocodile swept through the town I'm like whoa plot twist there's a crocodile now what's happening? So those kinds of occurrences sort of threw me out of the plot a little bit and made me puzzle out what was being said and also it was a bit slow to start I think getting the lay of the land introducing us to the characters each of their personalities what's happening there was a lot of setup and exposition so once we got through that and the events of the mystery really started to get underway it really picked up and I was really absorbed those are some thoughts on this I enjoyed it I'm glad I picked it up the apt selection for the Skeddy Cat Readathon I also wanted to touch back on the bell jar I don't think my immediate reactions on the bell jar were too cohesive this book is hella racist and I don't think we talk about it enough I was taught Sylvia Plath's poetry at school in high school in year 11 and we looked at it for its feminist themes it's themes of female suffering, the female experience, the pain of women, and ultimately a woman's yearning for liberation. We weren't taught the novel, we were just taught her poetry, you know, Lady Lazarus, Suburban Sonnet, like those very famous ones. But Sylvia Plath's racism was literally never discussed. And to be honest, I should not be surprised. Like, the what are the odds that a white middle-class lady um, prominent in the 50s and 60s was racist. Oh no, shocker. There are some really alarming scenes in this book. She makes really caricatured and stereotyped racial descriptions. She falls into some pretty heinous racial stereotypes. There's a scene where the main character, Esther Greenwood, is in hospital and it's meal time and the person who's serving the meals is a black employee and he's described in the most horrendous ways. This person isn't really referred to as a human being. They are just simply known as... I'm not gonna say it out loud because it's gross. He kept grinning and chuckling in a silly way. He gawped at us with big rolling eyes. He made an insolent bow. Oh, and here's the coup de grace. I drew my foot back and gave him a sharp, hard kick on the calf of the leg. She physically assaults this hospital employee because she's just annoyed by his presence? Like what? what? What white bullshit is this? I did mention yesterday how much I was affected by Sylvia Plath's rendition of the experience of mental illness and depression, although it's not necessarily labelled in this book as such, but I found that to be really visceral and her depictions of those sensations and the way it feels in the body, those bodily descriptions were really surgically precise and I think that really did 
move me. But this book is hella racist and literally no one I know who has read this book has talked about it, which is just astounding to me. It shouldn't be. I shouldn't be surprised. I'm disappointed, but ultimately not surprised. I read a really good article about it published on the Willamette Week. It was written by Crystal Contreras. It just goes through and analyzes the racism in this book and goes through how it fits into the whole white feminist ideology. So I really like this quote and I think it sums it up really well. White feminists perpetuate racism through fetishization, erasure, and outright mockery. Three issues that spring up more than once in Platt's famous novel. She ends the article by saying she'd skip the bell drive if she was you. She even recommends alternative books written by black and brown women that explore similar themes. So uh, the first of which is Sula by Toni Morrison. That's definitely on my reading list. And one I haven't heard of, it's called Canicula Snapshots of a Girlhood in La Frontera by Norma Cantu. By Norma Cantu. I haven't heard of this author or this, or this novel before, so definitely one to check out. So that was a very long rambly reading update. Oh my god, the most important part of that reading update that I was planning to film and completely forgot to. I wanted to give a shout out to an amazing booktuber that I discovered. Her name is Karenna and her channel is called Karenna Reads. I will link it in the bio and I urge you all to go watch her videos, subscribe to her, give her the love and attention and platform that she deserves because she's brilliant. The way she talks about books is just so joyful and effortless and I could hear her describe the books she reads for years on end. Brilliant. Literally, why are you still here? Go and subscribe to Karenna. So I wanted to film outside, but <laughs> it's not really many angles that work because my backyard is a little bit of a mess. So it's been a while since I last checked in on this vlog. It's It's been a bit hectic. Um, I sprained my ankle and I've just been very busy with work and, and, and lots of other just general life things. I've definitely not filmed as much of my journey with Sandhawk as I would have liked. Although, as you can probably tell, um, I've been reading this very, very intensely. There are lots of notes in here, in here, as well as in my actual notes book. So I've written plenty of notes. I am on page 144. So I am more than halfway through the book. It's a workout. Like, I'm not gonna lie. It's not a light read. It is stunning, but it is a lot. It's not really something you can get through very quickly. It's very, for me at least, the journey has been very intentional and slow. Every sentence also requires a moment of reflection and pondering, which is so important. Like some books should not be read quickly. Some books need to have that time spent with them. I could, I honestly think I could read this book five times cover to cover and still have questions and still have unresolved thoughts and reflections that have arisen from it. And I think that's what makes this book so wonderful and such and so important. This challenges the very fabric of how we think about the world, the very ways of knowing and being that in settler societies, in colonial societies have been conditioned into into living with. I don't know if that sentence made any sense. <laughs> it is October 31st today and I will not be finishing this book this month, but I thought that's all right because I think I'm not scared of this book anymore. As challenging as it is, I'm really grateful for that challenge and I'm really grateful for my mind to be expanded in this way and for the insights that Tyson Noon Kapoda has offered to us readers is such a gift and the labor that he's put in to conveying these ideas. I know it could not have been easy. My thoughts are very unformed on this book and I think they will be for a long time, but I'll try, I think I'm gonna try and finish it in the next month. Um, I mean, I'll have to finish it eventually because it is a library book, but I don't wanna rush through it basically. Sometimes it's just nice to sit outside, listen to the birds. Thank you for coming along with me on this journey. I've loved having you along for the ride for the Scaredy Cat Readathon. Thanks again to Smithy for putting this together. It's been such, 
such a treat to do. Go and subscribe to Karenna Reads if you haven't already done so. Like, what are you even doing still watching this? Go and subscribe to Karenna. She's brilliant. If you made it this far, please let me know in the comments what you've been reading, what you've been up to, just how you're doing. I'd love to know. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in November. I'm booking forward to seeing you in November. Almost forgot the thing. <laughs> Bye.